Welcome back. In this next video, I'm going to walk you through how we evaluate individual investment portfolio performance. So we'll start off talking about the techniques that are commonly used. Then I'll talk about the indexes that are very often used to measure and compare with your own individual performance. And then we'll talk about some of the more advanced metrics like the sharp measure, sharp ratio, trainer measure, Jensen's alpha, etc. So how do we actually measure portfolio performance? Well, the most basic way we do this is simply by calculating the return of the portfolio. The downside here is that it doesn't give us a benchmark to compare with. So if we had a 20% performance or return on that portfolio and the market was up 50%, yeah, maybe that look, our return looks good, but it absolutely underperformed relative to the broader market. So what we very often want to do is compare our portfolio's performance to that of at least one benchmark. We like to identify the benchmark well before the performance period and then just compare them at the end of your period. You could also take a look at how your portfolio performs relative to all managed funds with a similar investment objective. And then finally, we have these advanced metrics that you know we will talk about three of the most common, but there are a lot of other ones out there that you'll see in, say, uh, your, your portfolio management class. So where do we actually get the data? Well, we can get a lot of our data off of the Bloomberg Terminal or the Bloomberg API via Excel. We can get a lot of data off of Morningstar or Yahoo Finance. There's also some larger databases that you're less familiar with, like the CRISP database for stock returns. Uh, that's part of the WORDS data, uh, data system. Uh, most likely, uh, usually that, that database costs about $10,000, $20,000 a year uh, for access. So you, know, we, you don't have access to it as a student. Uh, there's all kinds of other index sources, though, if you need a, a broad benchmark, like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ Composite or the Lipper indexes. Okay, so how do we measure our portfolio's performance? The most common way we do this, or the, the starting point for us, is to calculate our holding period return, or HPR. Uh, that's our total return. That includes capital gains and any income received. So here's our standard calculation that you should remember from Finance 300. So the value of your portfolio at the end of the period minus the value of the portfolio at the beginning of the period plus any income received during the period. So I'll call that D for dividends, divided by our value of the portfolio at the beginning of the period. So here's another way to assess it. Our capital gain or loss is just the ending portfolio value minus the beginning portfolio value, or we could say this as value at time period one minus the value at time period zero. Okay, so what kind of returns can we expect from various asset classes? Well, for common stocks, be that public or private stocks, uh, we can certainly uh, expect capital gains, and we can also expect dividends. For preferred stocks, that's also true. We can expect capital gains, potentially, if uh, you know, the, the value of that preferred stock has gone up over time, uh, and dividends. You know, we get a regular dividend from these preferred shares. With bonds, there can absolutely also be capital gains. Maybe investors have bid up the price of a certain bond, and then we also get the interest income from the bond if we hold it assuming it's not a zero coupon bond. Uh, next, we have mutual funds. And mutual funds, yes, there are capital gains, and yes, there's also dividends. But with mutual funds, we can also get capital gains distributions. These occur when the mutual fund itself sells some assets in its portfolio. And those assets might incur capital gains. So it owned 100 shares of Tesla, and then it sold 100 shares of Tesla. And the capital gains distribution is split across the number of mutual fund shares and distributed to investors. The final two asset classes or groups of assets that we have, options and futures. So these will both have capital gains, but they're not going to pay out income. Okay, so let's take a look at a very quick example. So you have a security called da Dallas National Corporation. It's common shares. Uh, its state of pur purchase is May 1st of 20X3. Uh, we do that sometimes in say, like the CFA curriculum to denote, okay, it doesn't really matter what year this is, it's just uh, the year before 20X4. Uh, so on May 1st, 20X3, uh, the purchase cost was 27000 ish uh, Date of sale, May 7th, so the following year, 
20x4, sale proceeds. We got some dividends during that time period, and our holding period return is just the value at the end of the period minus the value at the beginning of the period plus the dividends received during the holding period, all divided by the you know, value at the start of the period, the, the purchase cost here. So there we go. And our holding period return, about 24.6%. Okay, now let's take a look at the pre-tax holding period return on a bond. So Phoenix Brewing Company, we have some 10% coupon bonds. Date of purchase, June 2nd of 20X3. Our purchase cost was $10,000. We sold those bonds for $9,700 on June 5th of the following year. And our interest earned was $1,000. So our holding period return is just $1,000 of interest plus the capital gains. So it ended at $9,700 and we started with $10,000. Divide that all by $10,000. And our holding period return is about 7.04%. Okay, now let's take a look at the holding period return on a mutual fund. So again, we have this mutual fund, we'll call it Pebble Falls. Uh, date of purchase, July 1st, 20X3 uh, for $10,400. Redemption, so that's the date that we sell our mutual fund shares, uh, July 3rd, 20X4. Sales proceeds, 10790 And we receive some distributions. So these come in the form of capital gains distribution and then also dividends. So our holding period return here is just our capital gains, so the value at the end of the period that we sold these fund shares for, minus the value that we bought them for, plus our dividends received for holding during the holding period, plus any capital gains distributions, all divided by the price we purchased these mutual fund shares for. That'll give us a, an HPR, HPR of 9.42%. Okay, so what can we do with that? Well, the most obvious thing we can do is compare our holding period returns to an index or a goal. So we've already seen this in class, but let's take a look at this particular mutual fund, the Fidelity Equity Income uh, Portfolio. So here we can see our equity, or sorry, our mutual fund's performance in blue. Zoom in here just a bit. And as you can see, uh, this particular fund has underperformed its broader index, and it's outperformed its investment category. So here, this is typically the way we would want to compare our performance of our, our portfolio to some benchmark, just see how it performs through time. We can also see how that portfolio performed relative to all mutual funds in the same category or with the same objective, say like right here. So ours was the, well, it was... Uh, uh, let's see, in the 44th percentile year-to-date uh, out of a total of about 1,200 different investments or portfolios with the same uh, objective and in the same category. Okay, uh, some other characteristics. You know, we, we do want to make sure that our portfolio is balancing risk and return. Uh, if we do see that we are not getting the appropriate return for the investment risk we're taking on, so we've got a low return for uh, an equity portfolio, and we're definitely underperforming our benchmark, we might want to reconstitute that portfolio. Uh, so this we typically do periodically, every six months or every quarter even. Uh, certainly every year we'd want to do this at the very minimum. Uh, so we want to see whether certain securities have become undervalued or overvalued. And you know if something has become overvalued, we may want to start to sell our shares of that. If it's undervalued, we may want to buy more shares. Okay, so let's take a look at another example here. So we have this portfolio that this guy, Bob Hathaway, has assembled. So he's got shares in a number of different securities. So, you know, these will assume they're all equities. So he's bought shares of about 10 different equities. Uh, we have the date acquired. And we'll say that we're looking at this on January 1st of 20X4. We know the total cost they paid. We know the current value of each of these assets and the current uh, total value he has in his portfolio, about $324,000. We can also calculate the dividend income on each of those assets in his portfolio. So we can see that for, say, Bank Corp West, it was $1.20 per share, and he had 1,000 shares, giving us $1,200 in dividends received for his Bank Corp West shares. So total, we can see his income in his portfolio. 
we can also see the unrealized capital gains in his portfolio. And when I say unrealized, I mean that he's not sold the shares of these securities. So he still owns $1,000 worth of Bank Corp West shares. His unrealized return on those shares is negative 10%. Not good, but it could be worse. And so if we want to calculate our portfolio's holding period return, there's a more complicated formula here that we can sometimes use if someone like this, like this Bob guy is adding new funds or withdrawing funds in the intervening period. It's basically our numerator stays the same. Dividends plus capital gains. So these are realized, realized capital gains where we sell our shares and unrealized capital gains where we keep the same shares in our portfolio. We divide all of that by the value of our portfolio at the beginning plus the new funds in our portfolio times the percentage of the year that we've held those funds in our portfolio minus any withdrawn funds times the percentage of the year that we've held those funds in our portfolio. So in this case, you know, portfolio value at the start of the period, 324. Portfolio value at the end of the period, 356. He's realized appreciation is about $3,000, meaning that he's sold $3,000 worth of shares from Dallas National Corp. His unrealized appreciation is, well, about $28,000, $29,000, and he got $10,000 worth of dividends. So his holding period return formula here would be $10,000 plus the dividends plus the unrealized appreciation, all divided by the value at the beginning or holding period return of 13.25%. Okay, so next we can use some advanced metrics to calculate portfolio performance. Uh, the most straightforward one is the Sharpe Ratio. And the Sharpe Ratio is just our risk-adjusted return. So it's our portfolio return minus some risk-free rate, usually the yield on like a 10-year T-note. Uh, we'll divide all of that by the overall volatility of the portfolio, or standard deviation of the portfolio's returns. So this is something you've already seen in this class. It is one of the most common risk-adjusted return formulas out there. So let's use that to calculate our Sharpe ratio. You have a portfolio with a beta of 1.25. We know the S&P 500 has a return of 12.75%. Actual return on the portfolio was 18.65%. Standard deviation was 0.24, And we know the yield on the 10-year T-note was 2.14%. That's going to be our risk-free rate. What is our Sharpe ratio? Well, here, here's the formula. So return the portfolio minus risk-free rate divided by the volatility of the portfolio. Uh, so we plug in our actual return on our portfolio minus the T-note rate, all divided by our standard deviation, and we get our Sharpe ratio. So 0.6851. You know, what does this actually tell us? Well, we'd want to compare our Sharpe ratio to the Sharpe ratio of other portfolios or other managed funds that have a similar objective to say whether we outperformed or underperformed. The next measure we have is the trainer measure. And the trainer measure, uh, just like the Sharpe ratio, the higher the better. Uh, the only difference here is in the denominator though. So we still have total portfolio return minus risk-free rate, but we divide that by the beta of the portfolio. And you know, so we have our formula here but the big thing I should say about the trainer measure is that it does something very similar, but it's, it's better in cases where the, uh, the portfolio is well diversified because once our portfolio is well diversified, we stop caring so much about total risk and we start focusing primarily on market risk of the portfolio, which is proxied best for by beta. Okay, so same example. We know our beta calculate the trainer measure. Well, here's the trainer measure formula. Same numerator up here, 18.65% minus 2.14% divided by the beta. And there we go, 0.1321. We'd want to compare that to the beta, or sorry, the trainer measure of other portfolios to know how we actually did. And then finally, we have Jensen's alpha. And Jensen's alpha is really just the alpha that we've already talked about in this class. The reason we call it Jensen's Alpha, or you know, the only time that we call it Jensen's Alpha, is when we have a portfolio that we're managing. Uh, every other time, if it's just like an individual stock, we just call this Alpha. So our Jensen's Alpha, it's positive if we outperformed our market expectations based on the CAPM. 
Uh, it's negative if we underperformed. Uh, so a lot of investors, including myself, would say this is the best metric to use because right away, once we calculate alpha, we know whether we did well or we underperformed. Basically, did we add skill? Because if it's a positive alpha, we added skill. We picked stocks that outperformed what they were expected to for their level of market risk. So here's our formula. We just rearrange the, the regression form of the cap M. And we have the return on the portfolio, so the actual return on the portfolio, minus the risk-free rate, uh, minus the beta of the stock, times the market risk premium, RM, or return on the market, minus risk-free rate. So same example, let's calculate Jensen's alpha. Uh, here's the formula. We'll take that over to the other side. So take the alpha over to, well, take all this over to the other side. So alpha is equal to everything you see here. And... If we actually plug in numbers, like our actual return on the portfolio minus the 10-year T-note rate, minus the beta times the market risk premium, our alpha is about 3.25%. Uh, because this is positive, it indicates that we outperformed what the CAPM predicted our portfolio would offer. Uh, positive alphas indicate outperformance, so this is a good thing. Okay, so uh, one additional thing I should say here is that let's say we've gone through, we've calculated our Sharpe ratio, our trainer measure, our Jensen's alpha, and we find that they are lacking. What do we do? Well, we would typically want to reallocate our assets into uh, assets that will hopefully offer better returns. So reallocation literally just means redistrib redistribution. Uh, now, we generally want to do that at the end of a period, say like the end of the quarter, or the end of a semi-annual period, or uh, hopefully a, you know, semi-annually or quarterly. Uh, annually, I suppose, is fine as well, but you don't want to go beyond that. Uh, so reallocate based on your own assessment. And then we do also want to rebalance our portfolio. Uh, what you'll see if you manage your own portfolio and you have one stock or one asset that significantly outperforms everything else, is that the weight of that asset will grow over time in your portfolio. And so you might have, oh, a, a larger percentage of your portfolio in that asset than you originally started with. That could lead to a little too much risk with respect to that asset. So you may want to sell shares or a portion of your investment in that asset and allocate that capital back into the other assets who saw decreasing weights. Uh, the benefit of doing that, that rebalancing, is that it keeps your portfolio diversified. And, you know, that, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's just what we do at the end of a period. We rebalance our portfolio because the weights will change. All right, so let's recap. You always want to compare your portfolio performance to a benchmark or a goal. So, you know, that's usually going to be an index benchmark. Uh, we measure portfolio returns using the holding period return formula. Sometimes we'll modify that as well. And then we also have some advanced metrics like the Sharp Ratio, Trainer Measure, and Jensen's Alpha. And all of those can be used to evaluate portfolio performance. So with that, I'm going to conclude. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you.